Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Today we are continuing our series, The Need for Followership. This morning we are encouraged as followers of Christ to put on the full armor of God. This morning we'll be following the service of word and sacrament as it begins on page 26 in the front of the red hymnal. We join in our opening hymn of praise, hymn 457. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise.
Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 18. In a showdown between Elijah and the false prophets of Baal, the Lord makes it clear that all the combined forces of hell are nothing compared to the Almighty God. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bowls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. O Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with our psalm for this morning, Psalm 46, which you'll find on page 46 in the blue supplement. It's page 46 in the blue supplement.
our second lesson is recorded in Ephesians chapter 6. So that we might, might be ready for battle, the followers of Christ are encouraged to put on the full armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. This is the Word of the Lord. Alleluia. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in Mark chapter 9. As we fight spiritual battles, Jesus assures us that everything is possible for the one who believes. That is, the one who trusts in Jesus as their Savior, the one who has already won the war for us. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the, bo the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn 537.
Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear followers of Christ, what was the worst war in human history? Some may point to World War II, which had the highest death toll, reaching nearly 90 million people. Others may point to World War I or the Vietnam War or the war in Afghanistan. Really, all of these wars and more were bad for their own individual reasons. Especially if you lost a loved one or a family member in that war. Or if you yourself had fought in that war. But none of those are the correct answer to the question. What was the worst war in human history? The worst war in human history began when the first shot was fired in the Garden of Eden. And it has been raging on ever since. It is a war, as the Apostle Paul tells us in our text for this morning, against spiritual forces of evil. This is not a war over a piece of land or resources. No, it is a war for souls. And the reality is that there are demonic forces who want to do more than kill you. They want you to spend eternity with them in hell. The good news, however, is that Christ has already called you to be his follower. And he has equipped you for this war. This morning, the Apostle Paul shares with us how followers of Christ put on the full armor of God. Again, this battle that we are in, as Paul said, is not against flesh and blood. Your struggle is not with a difficult boss or a crabby co-worker. It's not with that sibling or that classmate that you haven't spoken to for days because you weren't getting along with each other. No, your battle is against Satan and his minions. And that is so important for us to remember when someone wrongs us, maybe with their hurtful words or actions. It's easy to treat that individual as the enemy, when in reality Satan is using that person as his pawn. He wants us to react in such a way that would harm our relationship with God and also with that other person. But we won't let that happen if we are wearing the appropriate armor that God provides. So where do we get this armor? Well, it's not something that we scrape together ourselves. No, this armor is something that God provides for us. Trying to survive this fight with Satan dressed on our own is like someone going onto a battlefield with a homemade bulletproof vest that they made out of cardboard. It may look similar to the real thing, but when that first bullet tears through the flimsy exterior, it's going to prove otherwise. Likewise, Paul urges us to put on the armor that God himself has provided for us. So how does this armor work? Well, The Apostle Paul compares it to the armor that a Roman soldier would have worn. Paul first urges us to put on the belt of truth. Just as a belt helps to hold up our pants so they don't fall down around our ankles and become a tripping hazard, so also the truth of God's word keeps us from stumbling over Satan's lies. Satan says that there is no God. He tells us that everything came into being out of chance. That people are really just a more evolved animal and therefore they aren't accountable to anyone. When you die, that's it, Satan says. There is no heaven, there is no hell, so you might as well live it up right now. Do whatever makes you feel good. Take whatever you think should be yours. Everyone else is doing it, so why shouldn't you have fun as well? It's just a small example of the lies that Satan will use to try to trip us up. But along with this belt of truth, we have also been given the sword of the Spirit. That is the Word of God, which tells us 
how things really are. That God is the one who created the world and mankind. And God didn't make us to be his slaves. No, he wanted us to enjoy his blessings as we lived with him for all eternity. But sin ruined that relationship so that now people think that if there is in fact a God, that he is nothing more than a demanding boss. But he isn't. He is our loving Heavenly Father. That is what the Bible tells us, and when we study God's Word, it helps to keep those lies of Satan at bay. But Satan won't simply give up on on us with his attacks just because we are holding the sword of the Spirit, the, the Word of God. No, if anything, he's going to increase his attacks against us. And so Paul also encourages us to take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Satan is going to do his best to try to burn his way through our faith. And he might do that by getting us to fall into a particular sin or simply by getting us to go through the motions of being a Christian. That is why it might be worth Remembering that before Roman soldiers went into battle, they would often soak their wooden shields in water. This made it a a lot more difficult for the enemy's flaming arrows to cause damage. Likewise, wouldn't it be helpful for us to remember that we've been soaked in the waters of baptism? Satan's arrows will come and they will find their mark. But when we remember that we are forgiven children of God, when we remember that we can say no to Satan's temptations, then those arrows aren't going to continue to burn and do permanent damage. But you might wonder, what about those times when Satan's arrows do wound us and we run headlong into sin? Well, Paul reminds us that we've also been given the breastplate of righteousness to wear. You see, from time to time, we do doubt the word of God and we will do what we know is wrong. But we have to remember that we're not going to get into heaven because we have perfectly followed Christ. No, we are going to get into heaven because of God's grace alone through our Savior, Jesus Christ. When Jesus hung on the cross, as you may remember, Roman soldiers gambled for his clothing. Little did they realize that at that very moment, Jesus was fashioning for them and for all of us a breastplate, a breastplate of righteousness. And this piece of armor is so perfect and so strong that not one of Satan's accusations, which say we are nothing but horrible sinners, can possibly penetrate. Because we have that breastplate of righteousness from Jesus, we know what God's verdict will be for us on Judgment Day. He will say to his followers, I declare you not guilty of sin because of your Savior Jesus Christ. Come take the eternal inheritance I have prepared for you in the mansions of heaven. That is perhaps also why the Apostle Paul said that we've been given the helmet of salvation. Jesus' salvation allows us to keep our heads up in joy and in confidence. We can stand tall because Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. He declared, it is finished. And when he said that from the cross, it wasn't just our sins that he paid for. He was also saying that Satan and all of his minions were finished because their accusations against us are groundless. Now, there's still one piece of armor that Paul described in our text this morning, and it's our footwear. Paul put it like this. Stand firm, then, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You see, when we are wrapped in the promises of God's love and forgiveness through Jesus, we can then approach any situation with confidence. We can speak to those who have wronged us with words of forgiveness. We can speak to those who have suffered a loss and offer Jesus promise of eternal life. 
This footwear allows us to stand firm when the world is falling into chaos around us because we have the peace of knowing that Jesus is still in charge. And so we're all set for battle against Satan. We have God's full armor. We have a belt, a breastplate, a shield, a helmet, a sword, and the proper footwear. But we have even more than that. We also have a way to communicate with headquarters through prayer. And listen to how the Apostle Paul used that tool himself. He said in the verses right after our text, Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Paul kind of surprises us here, doesn't he? Instead of saying, pray that God would free me from captivity, he says, or asks the the Ephesians to pray that God would help him to courageously speak the word of God to his captors and to anyone else that he came into contact with. And that's a prayer that you can offer for me as well as followers of Christ. You can pray that I would not only boldly share the truths of God's word with you here on a Sunday morning, but also throughout the week as I come into contact with other people. And I pray that for you as well. That God would make use of your gospel peace footwear. And that he would help you to take that message of salvation to those who still need to hear. And no, you don't have to to do that alone. God, of course, is with you, and so are your fellow believers. And that is another asset that we have in this battle against the devil. The Apostle Paul was also helped by his fellow believers. Sure, Paul remained in prison, but he had his fellow believers come and visit him and encourage him in the faith. And Paul was now sending one of those fellow believers, a man named Tychicus, to take this letter to the Ephesians to encourage them in their faith. Isn't that a good reminder for us that even though we may be outfitted with God's armor, that this is still not a fight that we should engage in on our own. We need to keep banding together that we may encourage one another and pray for one another. We need to keep making sure that that equipment is thoroughly secured and that there aren't any gaps in our armor. Only then will we continue to stand firm against Satan who isn't going to stop his attacks until judgment day comes. Now, it's true that most of us live in towns and in neighborhoods where we, we seem to enjoy a lot of peace and security. But let's not kid ourselves. It's not a playground out there. It's a battlefield. But through faith in Jesus, we are ready for those attacks from Satan. Because as followers of Christ, we have put on the full armor of God. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all our understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find those on page 31. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures, He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, 
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we gather our offerings. Now I invite our adult confirmants to please come forward. Your members of St. Paul Lutheran Church, Ted Kirchner, Kylie Reese, and Lisa Downs have been baptized and instructed in the teachings of God's Word, and they desire to become members of this congregation. Your brother and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him on earth. You have come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer by saying, I do. Do you believe that the teachings of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from our Bible information class, is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer by saying, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, to be diligent in the use of God's word and sacraments, and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we, the members of St. Paul Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love, and invite you to share in our worship and mission. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Ted Kirchner, Kylie Reese, and Lisa Downs. Your church now invites you to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and holy joy. Regard your communion at the Lord's table as a precious privilege given you by God through his church. Receive this sacrament thankfully and often. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you have joined this brother and these sisters in Christ to your church when they were born again of water and the Spirit. In mercy you taught them your saving truth. Grant that they may offer themselves as living sacrifices to you as their spiritual act of worship. Transform them by the renewing of their minds so that they will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your, to your eternal kingdom, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Will the congregation please stand for the prayer of the church? Heavenly Father, we are constantly attacked by the forces of evil which seek to destroy our souls. In his bold attack, Satan not only tries to make us ashamed of the gospel and too timid to confess our Savior, his objective is to rob us of our faith altogether. He seems never to tire in his efforts to lead us away from the godly path of righteousness to the ways of sin. Dear God, in your word you promise that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. You have admonished us to take up the shield of faith with which we can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. We ask you, therefore, to bless our hearts richly with your grace through the Holy Spirit, giving us a strong faith and an overwhelming love for our Savior. By your Holy Spirit, keep us steadfast and true to your word, causing us to search it diligently in private study and to give prayerful attention to it when it is preached and taught. Nourish and strengthen our faith by your word and cause the instruction, the guidance, and the encouragement it gives to produce rich fruits in our lives. Forgive the times when we lost the good fight and fell into sin. 
forgive and renew us, strengthen and sustain us until we finally enter the kingdom of glory in heaven. Make your word powerful to save wherever it is proclaimed that more and more souls be won for Christ and rescued from Satan. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. This morning we also pray for the family of Nadine Beekler, uh, who is the aunt of Jeff Beekler. She entered eternal glory this past week. We pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for calling Nadine Beekler, our sister in Christ, to the knowledge of your Son and the holy fellowship of his church. We thank you for keeping her in faith through your word and sacraments and for taking her now to your heavenly rest. Comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. We ask all this in our Savior's name. Amen. And we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I encourage you to continue preparing your hearts and minds for receiving the Lord's Supper. Please stand. We continue on page 33 with the liturgy for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please remain standing for our closing hymn. be seated. Good morning once again. I'm glad that you could join us for worship this morning. We especially welcome our new members this morning, so please make sure you greet them. I know they're familiar faces, but it's wonderful to have them in our fellowship. We officially welcome you into our congregation today. It's a reminder, too, that Bible class and Sunday school resume this morning. Our Sunday Bible class is going to pick up where we left off last spring uh, with the series called Playing God. And today we're going to consider In Search of the Perfect Child. Uh, you can talk to my parents and they can let you know that my youngest sister. You know, <laughs> Trunk or Treat is also coming up uh, sat, uh, the third Saturday in October, October 19th. And there are sign-up sheets on a table outside the nursery. Plenty of room still to sign up. We especially need people to sponsor trunks. 
Uh, we have the theme picked for this year. We also have the trunk themes picked for this year. So all you have to do is check off which one you will want to do. If you need any help with that too, as far as what to do, there are also recommendations out there uh, for the trunks. But in addition to that, we also need other items for the event as well. Sisters in Faith, you will have your next meeting a week from today on Sunday, September 22nd. That will be after Bible class and Sunday school. All the ladies of the congregation are invited to attend. And finally, just a reminder that this Wednesday, our Zoom Bible class will resume as we continue our study of the judges. Uh, we'll begin with Samson. So please join us for that opportunity to be in the Word uh, during the week as well. Lord's blessings on the rest of your week.